in the Gulf. Fought in the name of religion, it sent hundreds of thousands to their deaths in human wave assaults. Total war that shocked the world with its use of chemical weapons. A conflict that threatened Western oil interests, dragging in the superpowers to protect them and prevent either side claiming victory. A war without material gain, yet one where Iraq could claim victory and pursue reward by seizing Kuwait, bringing the world to the edge of another conflict. For 50 years, Iraq's central worries had been the vulnerability of its oil fields and its need to cross other countries' land to pipe its oil because of its own narrow access to the Gulf. In an expansionist adventure, Iraq aimed to establish itself as a Gulf power by neutralizing its closest rival, Iran. Iraq invaded Iran in seven areas, in the north to protect its own northern oil fields and to cut the strategic road to Tehran while protecting Baghdad, in the center to cut communications between northern and southern Iran, and in the south to grab the strategic towns in the Iranian oil fields. The Khuzestan landscape favored invaders using tanks and armored vehicles, making it easy to drive deeply into Iran. With a five to one superiority and facing only one depleted Iranian armored division, Iraqi forces moved quickly despite lacking air cover. Often using tanks as artillery, they softened up distant targets with heavy barrages as troops moved into more local objectives. The Iraqi Soviet-made anti-tank gunships found few targets, scouting planes rapidly being pocketed by dugouts and entrenched artillery. The Iraqis had already proved these tactics against Kurdish rebels, but their strategy failed to recognize that defensive armies could also move quickly into position. Away from the Kurdish mountains, large armies could become clear targets for Iranian heavy artillery. Yet within three days, the Iraqis were laying siege to these strategic cities of Dezful, Akhvaz and Koramshah. They had failed to realize that the tactics which proved successful against mountain guerrillas would have less impact against large towns and cities able to defy encirclement. But oil was already a major objective. And though determined to take over Iran's production capacity, Iraq was prepared first to smash it. The effect of the fighting was to close the Shat al Arab waterway to all shipping. It would be eight years before any of these ships would be free to move again, making Iraq dependent on others, notably Kuwait, for transporting its oil. In the frontline cities, Iranian troops hurried to engage the invaders. Local resistance was led by Iran's revolutionary guards, who were fiercely loyal to Ayatollah Khomeini. They relied heavily on rifles and rocket-propelled grenades, and in sporadic engagements, exacted a heavy toll of the invading forces. From their example stemmed the Iranian mood of self-sacrifice in a holy war. The Iraqis crossed the Karan River near Karamshah and advanced on the oil town of Abadan, a top Iraqi target. It was seen as the gateway to the Gulf and Iraq deployed 60,000 troops and 1,000 tanks against its 10,000 defenders. But its preoccupation with taking Abadan distracted Iraq from easier military options. Generally speaking, Iraq's president, Saddam Hussein, overrated his troops' abilities. They were capable of quickly achieving one limited objective, but he set them too many, failing to choose between taking Koram Shah, Abadan, Akbaz, or Dezbul. By pursuing all at once, he lost time as well as the advantage of surprise. Only Koram Shah fell. Meanwhile, his losses mounted, 
and the devastation of border areas continued as the big guns homed in on the towns like Akvaz that were defying encirclement. Iranian phantoms hit back. Iraq had tried to copy the blitzkrieg tactics which won Israel the Six-Day War by smashing the Iranian Air Force on the ground, but either they missed or their bombs failed to explode. The Iranians carried out up to 150 sorties a day, mostly with planes kept airworthy by cannibalizing others. The Iraqis compounded their error with military planning so poor that they failed to provide adequate air defences for their own vital oil facilities. Oil facilities on both sides burned as the Iraqi invasion ground to a halt and hostilities entered a phase of sporadic war. Koram Shah in the wake of invasion. Its loss offended Iranian national honor and, dubbed City of Blood, it became a focus for the Iranian counterattack. Despite Iraq's initial advantages of surprise and manpower, its blitzkrieg had failed and it had to reconcile itself to a protracted war for which it was unprepared. Iraq's forces were led personally by President Saddam Hussein, a strong-willed, intransigent man whose lack of military training made him a careless planner. He entered the war with no clear idea how to end it, consistently overestimated the abilities of his troops and responded to setbacks by executing generals who retreated. For Iran, Hashemi Rafsanjani, Ayatollah Khomeini's most trusted lieutenant, was effectively the military leader for most of the war. Popular and charismatic, he had been sacked from the Shah's army for influencing troops towards the Islamic Revolution. He had a gift for simplifying complex tactics and became an ingenious and pragmatic commander. Inviting comparison with the First World War, Iraq made only minor territorial gains and, losing the initiative, built an artificial lake to protect Basra, its second city. Iran's obsession with capturing Basra would see them mounting repeated offensives through the marshes to the north, centered on the oil-rich Majnun Islands. Despite ferocious bombardments, Iraq was now failing in its objectives, confirming it had exhausted its capacity to make further gains. With supply lines badly overstretched, partly the result of unclear war aims and strategy, the Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein announced a voluntary withdrawal from all captured territory. In the event, and just as in Kuwait more recently, the withdrawal was not complete. Ironically, Saddam Hussein was sanctioning retreat, the very maneuver for which he had already executed three generals. Iraq's aim of undermining Iran's Islamic revolution had more than failed. Instead, successful Iranian resistance, then expulsion of the invaders, had cemented it. Khomeini's volunteers headed for the front, their martyrdom symbolized by the red waters of the bizarre fountain of blood in Tehran. With Iran gripped by religious fervor since 1978, they were ready for a high battle toll. But they lacked military skills and their habit of congregating indecisively presented the ideal targets that ensured a high casualty rate. They also had a message for Western governments supporting Iraq with armaments. These people here, these people who come here to fight, they just, I, I mean, they've left their families. They've left their houses. Just they want to come here just to fight the, the Iraqis. But your country is now helping Iraq, right? But why? You see these people? You how old is he? How old is this guy? He must be 14, 14 or something. Because he's come here to fight. He's left his mother, he's left his father. 
Just like the First World War, volunteer battalions were raised from particular towns. School friends encouraged to join together, like the British PALS regiments. Their slaughter on the borders of Iraq hit individual communities especially hard, but they turned the tide as Iran took the initiative. More innovative than the Iraqis, the Iranians used frogmen to spearhead a succession of offensives aimed at Basra. They headed waterborne attacks, penetrating the Awa al Hawaze marshes to try to cut the Basra-Baghdad highway. Supported by fast boats, their mobility surprised Iraqi strategists who regarded the marshes as a watertight natural defense barrier. With floating pontoons, these tactics were as innovative as those used by the North Vietnamese against the Americans a decade earlier. Iraqi strength in heavy weapons was now a disadvantage in battles that at their peak involved half a million soldiers with one in 20 killed in action. Iraqi forces entrenched behind the deeply dug in placements of the artificial fish lake east of Basra. Here, Iran's offensives were far more costly. On these flatlands dominated by heavily fortified Iraqi positions, Iranian human wave attacks without air cover provided ideal targets for Iraqi artillery. But often inflexible, the Iraqis were easily circumvented by Iranians moving south to another important success in this area, the capture of Umm al-Rizaz island in the Shat al-Arab. Here was another battlefield presenting images of the First World War, the winter conditions recalling the Battle of the Somme in 1916. Deeply dug trenches broken by strong points and dugouts smoldering from recent fighting. Everywhere signs of the soldiers' natural enemy. Thick mud, dried now, but recently the clinging stuff that bogged down the fighting. And brand new stocks of rocket-propelled grenades. Iran, now under arms embargo, was already self-sufficient in such weapons production. The prospect of Basra being cut off eventually panicked Iraqi leaders into widespread use of chemical weapons. Iranian gas masks afforded little protection and chemical weapons more than any other Iraqi ordnance were responsible for extensive Iranian battlefield casualties. Mustard gas and nerve agents were delivered by small, innocent-looking planes based near Baghdad. ITN's cameras were prevented from filming more of them. At first, the scale of its use surprised the Iranians, who were forbidden by Ayatollah Khomeini from following suit. In contrast, the chemicals that injured these people had been developed in Iraq under Saddam Hussein's personal supervision. At first, the world ignored the evidence, but in time, chemicals would be used in a manner that would shock international opinion. And everywhere, that other reminder of the First World War, the huge death toll. Though in fact light by those standards, every offensive cost each side an average of 15,000 dead, devastating by modern ones. Tehran, capital of Iran. 400 miles from the battlefields, it became a new front line from 1984. As Iran seized the initiative, Iraq began air and missile attacks in the so-called War of the Cities. Most devastating was the Scud B missile, bought from Russia and adapted to take a lighter warhead over 350 miles. Night after night, thousands of Iranians left their homes in Tehran to take refuge in the hills above the city. More than any other conflict in this series, this was total war, 
reaching out to touch civilians as much as the military. In three separate wars of the cities, thousands of civilians on both sides were killed and many more injured. It brought no tangible military or psychological benefit to either side, only suffering. <laughs> This was a clear attack on civilian morale, but partly through the wanton damage caused, it served instead to intensify Iranian patriotism. The Iraqi capital, Baghdad. Closer to the border than Tehran, it was vulnerable to tit-for-tat attacks as Iran replied in kind. But just as in Iran, the attacks, the deaths and the devastation served only to rally the people around a political system and leader that had been losing popularity. The war also presented an opportunity to Iraq's oldest internal enemy, the Kurds, who'd been fighting for an independent homeland since the First World War. At 21 millions, it would be the most populous Middle Eastern state outside Iran, but included Iraq's rich northern oil fields. While huge armies slogged it out in the south, the Kurds fought an effective hit-and-run guerrilla war in the northern mountains. An Iranian helicopter hugs the hilltops, dodging Iraqi artillery to supply Kurdish rebels. Ghost towns in the foothills, legacy of Iraq's ruthless deportation of a quarter of a million Kurds in an attempt to prevent rebellion. Ruins now occupied by Iranian forces whose persistent offensive sustained Kurdish guerrilla action to threaten Iraqi oil fields. More than anti-Iraqi sentiments, they also brought the weapons to make guerrilla war effective. For these hills climbing east into the Himalayas hid a large and unlike Afghanistan, cohesive guerrilla army. Known as the Peshmerga, they comprised two forces totaling 14,000 men under arms. Backed by Iran, Syria and Libya, their renewed resistance grew sharply from 1983. Soon they controlled a third of Kurdistan, pinning down 30,000 Iraqi troops. In this rugged terrain, guerrilla warfare was uniquely effective. The Kurdish leader, General Massoud Bazani, explained his objective. The significance of this operation for us is its a proximity to the city center and to the international highway, which is very important for the Iraqis. And beyond it, they have the oil pipeline which carry the Iraqi oil to Europe. The guerrilla group is given its orders to attack Iraqi patrols on the main highway between the oil fields of Kirkuk and the Turkish border. This was an area where the Iraqis were particularly nervous about rebel action because it was now the only export route for oil from its northern fields. The guerrilla's target is soon in sight. A passing car runs the gauntlet of the ambush. Casualties inflicted on Iraqi troops in such actions were less significant than their ability to disrupt oil traffic and divert large forces. 
and such actions were repeated constantly. In territory unsuitable for armoured columns, Iraq's generals resorted to shelling suspected Kurdish positions. The multiple rocket launcher was another formidable artillery piece, as effective here as in the flatlands of the Southern Front. Deep, strongly fortified dugouts reminiscent of World War I afforded some protection. But Iraq's frantic desire to stamp out this nagging opposition led to an action that shocked the world. Two jets swooped low to bomb a Kurdish town recently taken by Iran. An Iranian army camera caught the moment of impact, not high explosives, but cyanide gas. In less time than it took Iranian helicopters to fly over Halabja, some 5,000 civilians were killed. Many were frozen in the vain act of trying to protect babies and children. Two survivors described the incident. Because we know that it was the Iraqis airplane and they came here and bombed and left. Nor was it the first time Iraq's leaders had committed genocide against the Kurds. Some 5,000 were massacred in 1975, and another 4,000 were killed by chemical weapons days after the Gulf War armistice. Amidst the bodies, I asked an Iranian military official about the bombing. Why would the Iraqis do it to the, their own people? They did it to us also. But the Iranian needs to do, do it to the, on his own people. To us is okay, we are enemies, okay, we are fighting together, but why to his own people? The gains of guerrilla war were quickly being wiped out. It may be that the Gulf War saw an end of the traditional tribally based Kurdish guerrilla movement and that the future will see a modern urbanized one. Oil exports had again become targets this time in the tanker war. Iran's main oil loading facility at Harg Island was repeatedly attacked as were ships carrying her oil. Foreign tankers now had to steer a careful route to avoid Iranian territorial waters. But Iran retaliated from remote Gulf bases using speedboats armed with rocket launchers to attack ships suspected of carrying Iraqi oil. That action brought in the superpowers. In the opening months of the tanker war, some 70 ships were hit, first by Iraqi jets aiming to endanger oil shipping sufficiently to draw in the superpowers. Then, as now, oil supplies were considered a vital Western interest, which became threatened because Iran had no similar targets. Iraqi ships had been stranded either by fighting or by Iran's naval blockade. Iran had a superior navy, using British-built frigates to stop and inspect any shipping thought to be trading with Iraq. They operated with virtual impunity, largely because Iraqi pilots had no training in hitting naval targets. Some attacked suspected tankers with sea-launched missiles. Others used their radar to bring in missile attacks from land bases. In the first year alone, 1984, attacks came at the rate of two a week, with Iraq hitting three times as many as Iran. As tanker after tanker came under attack, the Kuwaitis, who felt most vulnerable, hit on a scheme to gain superpower protection. This involved getting ships re-flagged. That means re-registered in the name of a country like the United States, whose warships would then be allowed by international law to intervene in the event of any attack. The aim of the Iraqis would thus be achieved by a non-combatant, as increasing numbers of tankers trading from neutral ports were attacked. Some were the victims of air-launched Exocet missiles. 
Eventually, the United States President Ronald Reagan announced action to protect oil shipping in the Gulf. Let there be no misunderstanding. We will accept our responsibility for these vessels in the face of threats by Iran or anyone else. If we fail to do so, simply because these ships previously flew the flag of another country, Kuwait, we would abdicate our role as a naval power. And we would open opportunities for the Soviets to move into this choke point of the free world's oil flow. In a word, if we don't do the job, the Soviets will. In fact, Soviet warships were already in the Gulf, and as America hesitated, they leased the Kuwaitis three tankers, affording Soviet protection if attacked. Even more than Western powers, the Soviets faced a sharply growing dependency on Gulf oil. But the United States quickly followed suit to protect Western oil interests, not for the first time and not for the last. As tankers queued up for protection, the United States gave new identities to 11 Kuwaiti ships, half of Kuwait's supertanker fleet. To gain the protection of American warships, they took down their Kuwaiti flags and changed their names. The first, the al Reka, was renamed Bridgeton. Capable of carrying half of Kuwait's entire daily oil production, her re-registration was a turning point, signaling that Iran would not be allowed to win this war. The aircraft carrier USS Constellation, with its A-7 Crusaders and F-14 Tomcats, led a substantial part of the American 6th Fleet in protection duties. The British played a similar role as oil shipment now fell to convoys in a manner reminiscent of the Second World War. Iraq, which had no active navy, had succeeded in forcing its ally Kuwait into persuading others to keep the Iranian navy at bay and ensure safe passage for its supplies. They were moves that ultimately made the Gulf less safe, however, by prompting the Iranians to mine international waterways. Submersible television cameras searched for deeply laid mines, while helicopters hunted any on the surface. This was a role in which the Royal Navy specialized. Capture of the Iran Adjur was offered as final proof that Iran had been mining the Gulf seaways. Rows of mines on her deck as the evidence. After making the maximum publicity, the Americans sank the boat and repatriated its crew. But the presence of modern Western naval power did not prevent Iranian frigates from checking the identities of tankers in the convoys. This is uh, warship calling you. I'll get it over. Yes, I'm clear. I'm clear. This is the British tanker Isomeria. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, ship. What is your ship's name, please? Uh, ship's name is Isomeria. Far from deterring the Iranians, American and British presence provoked them into testing Western determination and confrontation increased. Iranian warship, this is U.S. warship 993. You're after gun mount just pointed in my direction. Do not do that again. Over. The Iranians played the same game. U.S. Navy ship, this is Iranian warship. If you hear me, it seems to me that your helicopter is unable to hear me on guard frequency 243. Advise him not to close to me less than five miles. Over. By now, the very tankers the warships went to protect were themselves protecting their escorts by steaming in front to act as mine shields. No bigger a contradiction, perhaps, than America's reaction to the Iraqi Exocet missile attack on the frigate USS Stark, killing 37 crew. The Americans blamed the close proximity of a shadowing Iranian gunboat and, far from retaliating, accepted Iraq's apology and redoubled efforts to prevent Iran intercepting Western oil supplies. Tit-for-tat attacks on oil installations followed. The Sea Island city terminal, 10 miles off the Kuwaiti coastline, was hit by Iranian missiles. Its temporary disabling was retaliation for a United States attack on Iran's Rashidat rig, which was not just an oil installation, but acted as a base for Iranian speedboats. These were crucial weapons in the Iranian armory, used so effectively in their marshland offensives. 
tragedy followed their attack on the American cruiser Vincennes. Incoming boat spotted on radar. Almost simultaneously, another apparent attack is identified. Its SAM missile is fired, unknowingly not at a warplane, but a passenger jet. Cat has got it. Oh, it's dead on. 290 civilians died, and with them, Iran's hopes of victory. Its leaders now believing the superpowers would stop at nothing to prevent Iraq losing. Iran, meanwhile, made its most important land gain, the Four Peninsula, taken in 1986 in a major thrust against the old target of Basra. This effectively cut Iraq off completely from the Gulf and the disputed Bubiyan Island area that would lead to its invasion of Kuwait. Offensive Wa al Fajr 8 brought Iranian forces closest to the objective that had eluded them for so long. Three Iraqi armored columns were destroyed as the Iranians made gains they were to retain for nearly a year. They had caught Iraq's static defenses by surprise to occupy land of no military importance but immense political significance. But the biggest prize, Basra, eluded them, just as large Iranian cities had defied Iraqi encirclement years before. Yet Iran itself had failed to learn that lesson, and this was the closest they got. Devastating barrages by rocket and artillery, backed by armored assaults, eventually enabled Iraq to break the Iranian stranglehold. With Iran eventually war-weary and on the brink of accepting the United Nations peace call, Iraqi forces once again poured across the border in a last-ditch land grab. Although the war had failed to produce a clear victor, Iraq's supreme leader, Saddam Hussein, contrived to convince his people that they had won despite failing in all his war aims. Saddam had made one clear gain, popular unity. On the banks of the war-torn Shat al-Arab waterway, statues of 99 of Saddam's fallen commanders point accusingly at Iran, glossing over the fact that it was Iraq which opened hostilities. Grandiose monuments like Baghdad's Arch of Swords were erected to celebrate Saddam's triumph over the hated Persians complete with its cascade of helmets from the battlefield. Iraq ended the war with a standing army of awesome size, a million men under arms, five times as many as in 1980. They were armed with the latest rockets, tanks and artillery, but to pay for them, Iraq's economy had been mortgaged to the tune of nearly $100 billion. At the same time, the oil industry, its biggest earner, was devastated. Ten million shells had landed in the Basra oil fields alone, and essential facilities now lay in ruins. Iraq's invasion of Kuwait brought Baghdad several rewards, enlarged oil production and revenue, the cancellation of war debts, and the satisfaction of an ancient territorial claim. Though clearly threatened, the takeover still caught civilians by surprise, and they fled inland as the invaders poured onto Kuwait City's beaches. The vastly outnumbered Kuwaitis offered unexpectedly stiff resistance. But they were seriously outgunned and outnumbered as the Iraqi assault focused on the barracks of Kuwait's elite royal guard, center of resistance beside the ruling emir's palace. That resistance crumbled with the arrival of Iraqi helicopter gunships, but the world reacted with unprecedented solidarity. The United States aircraft carrier Independence spearheaded a huge multinational force gathered to police the Gulf and support the state next thought to be at risk, Saudi Arabia.
Black Hawk and Apache helicopters were poured in in numbers not seen since the Vietnam War. Armoured divisions, American and British, were shipped to the area backed by troops from the United States and Iraq's rivals for Middle East leadership, Egypt and Syria. Hundreds of thousands of men now prepared for a further Gulf War.